Namaskar, everybody. I am addressing uh, uh, people I can't see, but I think I should be able to imagine all the people who are listening. Well, thank you all for being there. I am, uh, my name, my parents gave me the name Kapil Kapoor. I was a professor in JNU for more than three decades. And uh, I was a teacher of uh, basically English literature, but had moved on over the long teaching period that I had into several disciplines, philosophy, linguistics, aesthetics, Indian culture, India's heritage of knowledge, Indian intellectual traditions, and so on and so on. So much so that at the end of it all, my students used to wonder, what is my subject as a teacher? There were so many. Well, I am now 82, and I have been teaching for 62 years. So if when I'm speaking, if I repeat myself, or uh, if I uh, anor, uh, kind of, you know, sometimes go into giving a short anecdote or a story, you'll understand that's the privilege of an old man to repeat himself. I have been asked today to speak on Indian knowledge system in relation to higher education as laid down in the new education policy. Let me repeat, my subject is Indian knowledge. Now I like to call it India's knowledge. I have no, in fact, the phrase Indian knowledge system was in fact coined by me way back in 1975. Today it is perhaps one of the most frequent utterances, you know, you can, you open your computer and you find IKS, IKS. But I have changed over now to India knowledge. Instead of saying Indian knowledge systems, India knowledge. That is knowledge that belongs to India, that was created in India, and that has remained alive in India, remained alive in India. And my subject is this knowledge, India knowledge, it's place role in higher education as envisaged by the new education policy. We say this as envisaged in the new education policy because, my dears, so far, India's education system has no place for India's knowledge. We are, uh, we are, uh, we are having an education system which is uh, uh, for 182 years, which has been following our great uh, masters, the British, who introduced the English Education Act in 1835. And uh, they explicitly created this education system to produce those Indians who are Indians only in appearance, but in their opinions, values, intellect, and morals, they are British. This education, even today, the people who take this education, we Indians who take this education, we become distant distant from our own culture, our own tradition, our roots. I call educated Indians disaffiliated people. You know, we are disaffiliated people. Since at present, this education has no place for India's knowledge. Therefore, the new education policy has done a good, one good, in fact, it has done two, two innovations, which I'll come to pretty soon. But I'm talking today of Indian knowledge, higher education, new education policy. 
now let me talk about india knowledge india knowledge is a parampara a tradition of texts thinkers and commentators hamara hamare desh mein we had a very great uh, pandit ji from pune pandit bhagwat shastri ji who said bharatiya gyan parampara sanatan ganga pravah india's knowledge tradition is a perennial flow like the river like the river ganga and what does that mean that means india's knowledge from ancient time to today is a con- is 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 a continuous flow there is no break and there is no rupture we might not have this india knowledge in our education system but it is very much alive in the learned people our our traditional scholars in india who are innumerable they are not known they live in villages they live in towns they pursue sanskrit studies they pursue pali studies they pursue prakrit studies they pursue tamil studies and they are great scholars who are characteristically in our typical oral tradition who remember all the texts who hold all the texts in their mind so this uh, india knowledge may not be present in the present in the system of education but it is very much alive and living it is a tradition parampara let me explain the word tradition tradition in the last 30 years or so had become a bad word you know tradition it was opposed to modern but that's a very wrong meaning our word parampara gives you the idea of what a tradition is a parampara is par para one followed by another that followed by another followed by another and all linked like a chain so in every discipline practically every discipline of knowledge we have a chain a chain of texts thinkers and commentators tikakar i am adding the word commentator because the character of our education our knowledge the character of our knowledge is that we have in every discipline a primary core text a core text that core text is preceded by many texts but that core text is a summum bonum of that of the whole long tradition for example in grammar grammar panini 7th century bc panini's grammar ashtadhyayi the eight chaptered ashtadhyayi is an internationally acknowledged the only grammar of a only grammar complete comprehensive rule bound of human languages the only grammar of a com- only complete exhaustive comprehensive rule bound explicit grammar of a human language as one of the great uh, german american scholars bloomfield put it ashtadhyayi panini is ashtadhyayi is a great is the great is one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence now that ashtadhyayi is a primary text in the grammatical tradition grammar and it was preceded by many grammarians maybe a thousand years or 2000 years of study but panini you know summarized that tradition and he summarized it as our one traditional pandit says he put the entire ocean in the in the space of a cow's you know foot cow's foot जैसे गाय का पैर का साइज गाय के पैर के इंप्रेशन में गाय के पैर के साइज में धरती पे जो गाय के पैर का सा बनता है उतने में पानिनी ने पूरे समुद्र व्याकरण के समुद्र को डाल दिया ग्रामर को एंड दैट बिकेम दाइम दाइमरी टेक्स्ट बट बिकॉज 
and it is a very brief text. It is the oral tradition. In oral tradition, the texts have to be have to be had to be very very brief, precise, because they have to be remembered. They had to be put in the mind, and you can't have a huge text to be put in the mind. Discursive text. So these texts were composed in very 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 metrical and very very precise. You know, countable. Syllables, not even words. So Panini's complete Ashtadhyayi is a composition in thirty-two thousand syllables. I am not saying words. Akshar, बत्तीस हजार अक्षरों में सिलेबल में वो पूरा व्याकरण है और वो संपूर्ण व्याकरण है, explicit है, rule bound है. कोई भी प्रश्न आप उसमें से पूछ के नहीं पूछ सकते जिसका उत्तर उस ग्रामर में नहीं है. So 32,000 syllables. Now, because they were so abbreviated, the texts were more or less opaque. Ordinary man cannot understand, or a student cannot understand. See, they are so brief. Vridhira de chadenga guna, you know. So we needed people to explain, and though people who explained, they wrote a commentary, tika, tika, and they are of different. There are many kinds of tika. You know, but there are paraphrases, there are explanations, there are great, you know, encyclopedic introductions. So, for example, Patanjali's Mahabhashya, the great commentary, is an eight-volume commentary on thirty-two thousand syllable grammar. Anyways, so Tika Kar, I am saying, our tradition of knowledge is a continuous linked chain of texts, scholars. And commentators, commentators. Now, the characteristic knowledge systems. You see, we have when I when I say we have a tradition of text thinkers and commentators in all disciplinary formations, all disciplines, or all Indian disciplines. So we should have some idea of what are the Indian disciplines. We divide our texts. one of the one of the typologies of our knowledge text is a threefold typology the nigama the vedas the vedic literature and then the agamas the literature which came after the vedic is deeply related to the vedic but uh, but adds and explains and modifies the certain things and becomes a foundation of uh, you know various systems of thought which arose later for example shaivism buddhism you know etc so you have nigama you have the agama and then we have divya vidyas extraordinary disciplines extraordinary sciences which are you know threshold sciences which are sciences which are which are rooted in consciousness chetana chetanya and uh, by the way i must tell you that the west after having reached boundaries of its thought and they didn't reach these boundaries without indian knowledge you must remember in 19th century harvard university started translating in 1891 they translated 123 indian texts into english 123 you know and of course they told us that sanskrit is a dead language and since we are faithful followers we accepted it and we said sanskrit but they didn't think sanskrit is a dead language they translated 123 texts then max muller he in max muller what are called the sacred books of the east another 50 texts so you know the 19th century europe in fact 19th century europe depended heavily on indian thought borrowed heavily from indian thought and all contemporary european thought is derived from the 19th century interaction of europe with india i will just give you one example that ferdinand de saussure ferdinand de saussure who is known to india as saussure as the father of structuralism he was the father of structuralism 
from structuralism in europe they went to post structuralism from post structuralism they went to post modernism and all this they owed to owed to three persons yeah, basically ferdinand de saussure then tubertskoy of praha university and uh, hara jakobson jakobson of russia jakobson you see ferdinand de saussure was a professor of sanskrit in geneva university and he used to teach sanskrit and his uh, his basic interest was in is he was in rigvedic rigvedic symmetries symmetries and in grammar and in grammar and he 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 gave lectures in sorbonne university we, the notes were taken by the students which were published as a book and which is the book by which he is known the, the uh, a cours de linguistique generale a course in general linguistics Sassure, therefore, was a professor of Sanskrit, and he is the father of European thought. So you can imagine it is Sassure who shifted the European mind from thinking that language is writing. Since Moses, they thought language is writing, but Sassure, following the Indian system, said no, language is speech, speech, and that created what they call a phonocentric revolution. A phonocentric revolution. Anyways, Trubetskoy of Praha University, Czechoslovakia, his his PhD, his PhD was in in Rigveda, in Rigveda. Sasyor's PhD was in the genitive case in Sanskrit grammar, and the third person, Jakobson, you know, for Jakobson, a very eminent European thinker, his PhD was on magic mythology. so you know the contemporary european thought is an outgrowth from indian thought they interacted with in 19th century now the knowledge that the texts they translated they come from these now europe after having pursued pursued their sciences and arts and philosophy in the interaction in interest of the indian mode they reached a the boundary and now the western science western science has begun to feel that we have to now cross a threshold and what they call the threshold sciences are the consciousness sciences consciousness sciences sciences which believe not in cause and effect of matter cause and effect of matter but cause and effect of chetana human mind human consciousness and those those kinds of sciences in our tradition are called divya vidya now there are 18 nigamas i need will not spend much time on this there are four vedas six vedangas and there are four other things and there are 120 agamas 120 agamas out of which let me tell you that 18 at least are sciences lies exactly like your modern sciences you know rasayan chemistry metallurgy all these sciences so 18 of the agamas are are sciences and divya vidya are 64 they are divided into three sets they are where the 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 power the power to do something comes from the mind second the power to do something comes from a blessing of a power beyond humans somebody you know sits down in deep meditation like lord buddha for 5 years and then a flash comes to him now that is a daivika a god's intervention somebody comes from something comes from him as a flash as a flash and the third kind of extraordinary consciousness sciences are those which are from control of your senses control of senses if 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 you do, if you control your the sense of sight sense of sight control in the sense that you only see what is good what is powerful what is light and you don't see darkness you increase the power of your eyes so much that when if that you can shut your eyes and see things and that is how our thinkers you know they they thought they saw they saw not by opening the eye but they saw 
with their eyes shut and they were able to see the past the present and the future the future so these are divya sciences i won't spend much time on them maybe sometime if your ignu ask me to speak only on these uh, vedic sciences i can speak independently of that but right now we move to the next subject i am saying that in all these sciences that i have listed 18 enigmas 120 agamas 138 64 64 212 sciences sciences because you know in india we don't make there, there is a difference between gyan and vigyana gyan and vigyana gyana of his the superordinate category knowledge all knowledge and the one of the sub category is vigyana vigyan is that knowledge which you gain by observation which you gain through senses sensory knowledge what in the west would be called empirical the empirical knowledge empiricist empiricism so those are that is the those are the sciences which are so 100 212 vedic sciences we do not give a special prestige to vigyan science for us everything is a science after all in europe also you know this uh, difference between science and art is an anglo american obsession Amer obsession of the english people and the american people in in europe they say they have science of music they have science of dance they have science of religion you see for the science of philosophy for them you know science does it sense is simply science is a mode of inquiry a mode of inquiry a a very 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 logical mode of inquiry in which you use logic and in which you use experience and in which you use experiment so you know your experiment is a controlled experience a recreated experience so you know you do this and that is is a science science simply means science is depend is a methodology methodology after all knowledge what is knowledge there are objects of knowledge and there are means of knowledge and there is a knower and there is there are systems of validating knowledge whether it is correct or not and science is simply one mode of inquiry so for us everything is a science then let me come to that what are the characteristics of india knowledge hamara jo gyan hai uski kya uski kya lakshan hai uske kya lakshan hai what are the characteristics of our knowledge first of all our knowledge tradition is continuous imagine we have the world's oldest book we have the world's oldest poetry we have the world's oldest prose we have the world's first book of arithmetics we have the world's first book of sociology we have the world's first book of phonetics we have the world's first book of etymology we have the world's first grammar we have the world's first book on meter you will be surprised to hear all this but this i am not making up this is all attested you you can i can name the books name the books so we are in fact a knowledge centered civilization from day one indian civilization hindu civilization is in fact a knowledge centered civilization and hindu culture is a value loaded culture and hindu society is a kartavya paraka a duty oriented society duty oriented society and uh, the hindu society is a unity is a unity of consciousness and that consciousness is generated by a very powerful knowledge system and knowledge tradition and uh, of course the hindu civilization is sanatan we are the first we are the first idea system in the world we were the only idea system in the world we have no actual actual physical concrete archaeological records of 7000 years you know 7000 bc you know we have the mehrangarh and we have the sinoli excavations near haryana where they have found chariots which they have dated up to 5 to 6000 bc so we are the only surviving civilization of the 46 human civilizations and we are a knowledge oriented civilization what is the character of our knowledge number 1 it is continuous rigved se leke guru granth sahib tak guru granth sahib 
let me let me tell you because you are a large audience and you are from all over india i think you should be aware that india has a continuous intellectual tradition from 5000 bc rigveda to 1600 1700 ad 1700 ad guru granth sahib you can chart it guru granth sahib there is a both the texts both the texts were composed in punjab both rigveda was composed in punjab guru granth sahib was punjab composed in punjab punjab or sapt sindhu is in fact the forehead of india forehead just as kashmir was the mind or the brain of india punjab is the forehead of india and rigveda is a collection collection of the sayings of the wise men of those days rishis collection of saying arranged in 10 mandalas 10 mandalas and it is in in chand meter composed in meter guru granth sahib is also a collection of the sayings of the wise people of all over india in the 17th century you have namdev from maharashtra you have kabir from up you know the 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 16 great thinking poets of india and 25 bharts the brahmin thinkers they are put together in the guru granth sahib rigveda is 10 mandalas guru granth sahib is arranged in 10 gurus 10 gurus rigveda is in meter and guru granth sahib is also in meter and rigveda is the first text of sanatan dharma and guru granth sahib is the most recent text of sanatan dharma you know and that is how it is rounded india's knowledge is rounded you know from from the first thinker of the agni 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 hymn the first hymn of rigveda to guru gobind singh who composed akal stut a prolonged meditation on the concept of brahman brahman so you see the character continuity second cumulative the knowledge is cumulative in india every subsequent thinker is aware of all the thought that has gone before him there is no nobody nobody suddenly arises ignorant of the past if you if you make a chain or if you uh, you know like the ganga river as in that saying says if you if you make the the topography of a river india's knowledge as a river you can see the continuity of ideas and every subsequent thinker you know i give an example for example bhartri hari in the 5th century writing his vakya padya says i am not saying anything new i am not saying i am only explaining what patanjali said and patanjali said it in 2nd century 700 years later a thinker is saying and in between he is aware of everything that has gone on everything that has gone on the chand vyakarana the buddhist the jaina thinkers bharat natya shastra everything he is aware of this is how india's knowledge is cumulative continuous and cumulative cumulative you see then third 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 feature third feature is interdisciplinarity for example no in india knowledge is not divided into disciplines knowledge is considered as one knowledge is one you see and we only divided into small domains for convenience of learning convenience of teaching and learning but knowledge is one no single domain is autonomous the every domain depends on something else just as in life no human being is autonomous every human being depends on so many others so many things the interdependence the interdisciplinarity is a characteristic of india's knowledge you know when you are doing grammar i'll give you one example of a grammar grammar rule grammar rule a rule of grammar in panini is ashtadhyayi it's a rule of grammar is it that our our avasana to pause i mean i'll translate it the rule is to pause is to end to pause is to end now this is a rule about putting a marker 
that the statement is completed. You see, when we are speaking, when I'm counting, I will count and at some point you will feel I'm concluding. Like, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, when I say ten, you understand it is concluded and I have paused. To pause is to end. Now, this is a rule. Uh, this is a rule, which is a rule of grammar. But look at the philosophy of Asana. You see, that is why the Rig Veda says, Charvayati, Charvayati. It tells the, to the human beings, keep moving, keep moving. When you stop moving, that is the end. That is the end. You see, when the arrow stops flying through the air, it falls to the ground. So it's philosophy, you know, I like that. And there are many concepts, in fact, principles of other disciplines, which are, for example, lopa, lopa, disappearance. Lopa is, lopa is simply the concept of zero, zero. Now, zero is a mathematical concept, and Panini uses it in his grammar also. So interdisciplinarity, 